welcome everybody to this uh, Ig Nobel event. Um, this is a joint event organized by Radboud Reflex and uh, uh, I want to, s s it's, it's over there, the Center for Language Studies. Um, my name is Lisa Duland, I work as a program manager at Radboud Reflex and I will be uh, one of the hosts uh, of this event. Um, so. I'm 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 the the second one really I'm introducing now but then I will uh, invite Mark Abrams founder of the uh, uh, Ig Nobel Prize and um, hosting loads of these events uh, to come on stage and um, uh, and I invite you all in and tell you more about this improbable research um, but that's for 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 later so. What is the value of improbable research, uh, of research that is unexpected, that is not likely to be true or, or just plain weird? Um, for instance, research on homosexual necrophilic ducks. I think most of us remember it. It's been some time, but it made quite an impression when I heard about it. Um, I think some 15 years ago now, it's a long time ago. Uh, also, people uh, walking on water the word, huh, why do scientists conduct such improbable research and why is it valuable? So the Ig Nobel Prize is a, a sort of a parody of the Nobel Prize, of course, awarded annually since 1991 uh, at Harvard University. And in the words of Ig Nobel Prize founder Mark Abrams, it is a science award that makes you laugh, then think. So that will probably be happening a lot tonight as well, laughing thinking, of course, reflecting also. Um, when do we, uh, yeah, so we'll be asking when do we consider research or science to be trivial, trivial and can absurd science be good science or maybe, maybe it's necessary to be a bit absurd, that science is a bit absurd. And why should we celebrate, because that's what we're doing tonight, I think, seemingly odd research. All right, so we would have had three Ig Nobel Prize winners here tonight, um, but one of them uh, became ill and couldn't be here tonight, a neuroscientist, Nadia Dominici. Uh, she would have told us about her research on walking on water, um, but uh, we'll, we'll delve into it later a bit anyway. We will be joined by linguist Mark Dingemanser from the University, uh, who explains, uh, who will explain his research on the universal importance of the word "huh." Um, and biologist Kees Moeleker, um, who will elaborate on his research on the necrophilic duck uh, and homosexual duck, so that I mentioned already, and uh, um, necrophilia elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Um, so that's that, but first let me introduce my co-host for this event, uh, Mark Abrams, founder of the Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, he's the former editor of the Journal of Irreproducible Results, which is, I think, a bit dodgy in, uh, in science, but, uh, uh, but maybe not. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that. And editor and co-founder of the Annals of Improbable Research. So um, give him a warm welcome, Mark Abrams. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Thank you for coming, and thank you all for inviting us here tonight. I'm going to show you lots of things. I will explain them as we go along, and if you have questions afterwards, be very happy to answer them. Uh, if you have a question that's really bothering you, you can shout it out. I may not reply, but you can shout it out. <laughs> Door is over there, sir. <laughs> going to begin by telling you about two people who won Ig Nobel Prizes in the past who died recently. And briefly, of course, a word about what these prizes are. Some of you, I think, know them well. Some of you may have no idea what this is. Ig Nobel Prizes are prizes. We've been giving them every year since 1991. Ten of them every year. They are unusual. They are not for things that are good. They are not for things that are bad. Good and bad, that is irrelevant. They are for things that make people laugh and then think. And that's the only criterion. Now, two of the past winners meant a lot to me, and I, I feel I, I 
I need to say something about them. One is named John Senders. John won a prize in the year 2011. We gave it the category public safety. The categories really uh, change from year to year depending on what the, the winners are. John Senders was um, almost 100 years old when he died. And uh, he had a very long and productive life. He won his prize for some research he did in the early 1960s for uh, the United States government about safety in driving an automobile on a highway. He was interested in the question about distraction. When you're driving an automobile and you look here, you look there, things happen, how much distraction can a person tolerate before they become dangerous? Here's a little piece of a news report from the early 1960s with John on display. Usually permissive atmosphere and the interest in ideas. But their work isn't all desk work, as shown by this experiment on the attention span needed for safe driving. The experimenter is against director, psychologist John Sanders. Driving along the section of Route 128, and I'm trying to get an estimate of the demand driver by this particular section of road. The speed of the car is constant, and as the road varies from moment to moment in the demand that it makes upon me, I must look. Well, I think you get a flavor of what he was doing. He published some papers. If you want more detail, you can look up those papers. You can always go to our website for links to all of these things. The other person I want to mention who also died recently is Troy Hurtabies. Troy is Canadian. He won his prize in the year 1998. At that point, he had spent about seven years personally building and testing a suit of armor that he hoped would allow him to go out and spend time alone with a grizzly bear. <coughs> I'll show you a little piece of a documentary film made by the Canadian government. Uh, we built another suit, uh, which we had planned to do, and yeah. uh, redid the test, this time magnifying it to, to uh, how would one say, refute all. Uh -huh. uh, we, uh, we pushed the trucks up to three-ton trucks at 50 kilometers an hour, uh, and then, of course, put the A three-ton truck three ran into at 50 kilometers an hour? Uh, 18 times. <laughs> How would you, the question is, how did he die? How would you guess that he died? <laughs> that to me, in fact, that question gets at, at the thing that always fascinates me about Troy. You, know, you may see somebody doing all this and decide he has a problem with judgment. <laughs> but I, I would like you to consider a fact about him. He did this for years, for years. And not just this, many more things, far worse than this. And he survived. Think about how careful somebody has to be, consistently careful, to continue doing this stuff and stay alive. How many people have you even met in your lifetime who are that consistently careful? Now, the other side of him, how many people have you met in your lifetime who would do this is a related question. Uh, I want to mention one other thing about Troy. When he died, and he died in a traffic accident is how he died. When, after he died, there were reports in the Canadian newspapers, and I learned a fact about Troy in an obituary that I had not known. Remember that truck that you saw driving into him? The person driving that truck was Troy's father. 
Now, having seen these two things, I hope you will agree that these kinds of things deserve some kind of prize. And that's why the Ig Nobel Prize exists. I'm going to tell you a bit about the prizes and a few of the winners. And again, this is the only criterion. Many are about science, but they don't have to be. We give prizes in any field. It has to be real. It has to make people laugh when they first encounter it. And then there has to be something about it that sticks in people's minds so that a week later, they still want to think about it and tell their friends. That's what we look for. We get something like 10,000 new nominations every year for these prizes. What we do not choose in one year, we consider again in future years. And in most cases, we offer it quietly to people. We give them the opportunity to decline this great honor if they want to. But most people say yes. I'll show you a few of the, uh, the winners from over the span of the past 29 years, and then I'll talk about the most recent winners. This is a paper from a medical journal from The Lancet, one of the top medical journals in the world. And the title pretty much sums up the whole thing. A man who pricked his finger and smelled putrid for five years. He cut his finger, it got infected, he smelled bad. He smelled so bad, people could not stand to be in a room with him. He went to doctors, the doctors could not stand to be in a room with him. They tried everything they could think of. After five years, he stopped smelling bad. That's the whole story. This is an illustration from a patent. The lead inventor is Dr. Elena Bodnar. She describes this as a brassiere that in an emergency can be quickly separated into a pair of protective face masks, one to save your life and one to save the life of some lucky bystander. <laughs> she came to the ceremony and gave the first public demonstration of the emergency bra. And then we had a further demonstration. And I'll, about that, I'll tell you a little about the ceremony. The winners are kept very secret until the moment we introduce them on stage. The ceremony happens in the US at Harvard University. And we have not only the winners, but a large audience, 1,100 people from all over. And it's televised. And on the stage, we also, every year, have some Nobel Prize winners who shake the hands of these Ig Nobel winners and hand them their prizes. Well, Dr. Bodnar, with the first prototypes here, um, what she did was reach into her dress, pull it out, and separate it. And then she looked around, and she asked three of the Nobel Prize winners on stage, who had not heard of this until that moment. They don't know who the winners are. So when I show you the next picture, keep that in mind. It was only one minute before this happened that they were ever aware that such a thing exists. She asked three of them to come over and assist her in a demonstration. <laughs> right. And just look at the expressions on those faces. Is that Paul Krugman? Yes, that was Paul Krugman. And uh, this is another medical paper that won an Ig Nobel Prize. It was written by three doctors in Scotland. It's called, as you can see, the Collapse of Toilets in Glasgow. They had a series of patients with injuries that happened while each patient was sitting on a toilet in Glasgow. The doctors wondered what was going on. Was it something the patients were doing? Were they fidgeting? Or were these patients extremely large, heavy people? But no, it turned out they live in a city with a lot of old buildings that are not taken care of very well, and the toilets are not taken care of at all, apparently. So, Keep this in mind when you're making your travel plans. <laughs> the man in black won the Ig Nobel Peace Prize about 15 years ago. His name is Daisuke Inoue. He is the inventor of karaoke. <laughs> we gave him the Peace Prize rather than some other category because by inventing karaoke, he invented an entirely new way for people to learn to tolerate each other. And as you can see, we had, uh, after he gave his acceptance speech, we had a, a, a karaoke tribute sung to him by some Nobel Prize winners. It was a <laughs> touching moment. This paper won the Ig Nobel Physics Prize. The title you can see is An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Over Various Surfaces. 
This work was done in Australia. <laughs> and this, several times I've done public events with one of these authors, and he always ends up by saying rather sheepishly that one of the main things they discovered is it's easier to drag a sheep downhill. <laughs> they always stick in my mind also because they were one of the, actually many, but they were one of the Ig Nobel winners who, when I called to offer it to them, they immediately said yes. But also that phone call was the first moment any of them realized that what they'd done is funny. <laughs> this is a penguin. And you may know that many penguins, when they excrete, when they poo, they send out a long line of white excrement. That's what those lines are, you see. We gave a prize to a team of scientists who calculated how much pressure must build up inside a penguin to make this possible. Man on the right here won an Ig Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for doing some experiments and calculations to try to understand the physics of what happens when you hold a cup of hot coffee in your hand and walk backwards. We had given a prize 10 years earlier that inspired him to do that. The earlier prize went to a team of scientists who calculated what happens and, and measured what happens when you hold a cup of hot coffee in your hand and walk forwards, <laughs> and it spilled. And it turns out the physics is substantially different in both cases. Now, you may notice there's another man in the photograph, and that he's not wearing many clothes, and that he's painted silver. That man's name is Jim Brett. He's Dr. Jim Brett. He has a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's, uh, he's an inventor. He's started many countries, not countries, many companies. <laughs> may have started countries, for all I know. He's invented lots of things, but to me, there are two great things he's invented. One is what he's doing there. Uh, when he's on stage doing this, we call him a human spotlight. And his job is to illuminate the proceedings. The other thing that he invented that I think is kind of a big deal is a thing called 3D printing, three-dimensional printing. Jim Brett's one of the people who invented that. Okay. Same guy. <laughs> this is a patent granted in 1965 to George and Charlotte Blonsky, a married couple. They describe this as a device to assist a woman in giving birth by using centrifugal force. <laughs> this device, as you can see, is a large round table. When the woman is ready to give birth, she lies on her back on the table. They strap her down, and then the table is rotated at high speed, and the child comes flying out. This and every other one, I, I really strongly suggest that you go and read the actual thing because I'm giving you only the barest essence of it. And there are so many more details worth savoring and thinking about. All right, I'll tell you a little about the ceremony. We have a grand gala ceremony. It includes, let's say, extracts from every other kind of public event that all of us have had to suffer from. And we take them, we turn them upside down, and run them at high speed. And if we ran it at any kind of normal speed, it would last half the night. This is an Ig Nobel Prize. If you are offered a prize and accept it, this is what you get. The design is different every year. They are handmade, always from extremely cheap materials. <laughs> this was the prize in 2017. This was the prize last year. We have a theme every year for the ceremony. Now, the theme does not necessarily connect at all with the individual things that get prizes, but we do a lot of other stuff, including an opera. Every year, we write a little opera. It's performed by opera singers and these scientists on stage. The theme this past year was the heart, as you might guess from that. And we do have those scientists on stage uh, presenting the prizes. This was, I think, about 10 years ago. And that year, we had nine Nobel Prize winners on stage handing out the prizes. And uh, there are some other people visible here. I'll mention just one. The older gentleman in the back row, smiling with the glasses and the white hair, is named Benoit Mandelbrot. 
Some of you may know of him. He invented a mathematical concept called fractals. And if, if you're not familiar with that word and that, you might ask somebody later on sitting next to you because you, you might get a lot of delight of learning from that. Now, you may also notice there's a little girl. She is the most important person in the ceremony. Every year, we recruit a really cute little eight-year-old girl who has a very particularly strong kind of personality. And she sits on the side of the stage during the whole ceremony. I introduce her, and I explain that whenever she feels somebody has talked long enough, she will let them know. We tell the winners, you get to talk longer than anybody else. You get about one minute, usually. Whenever the little girl feels somebody has talked long enough, she gets up, she walks all the way across the stage, goes up to the person who's talking at the microphone. She looks up at that person and she says, please stop, I'm bored. Please stop, I'm bored. Please stop, I'm bored. Please stop, I'm bored. She does not stop until they do, <laughs> and it works. We would love to give money to the winners, but we don't have any money. However, that didn't stop us. We figured out a few years ago how to do this. Now every winning team gets cash. They get a large amount of cash. They get $10 trillion. They get a $10 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. Here, too, if you're not familiar with the history of Zimbabwe and uh, its money, just ask somebody around you. The person responsible for creating these $10 trillion bills is Dr. Gideon Gano. He was head of the National Bank in Zimbabwe, and he won an Ig Nobel Prize for doing that in the field of mathematics. <laughs> this is Sanders Theater at Harvard. This is where the ceremony takes place. You're looking at part of the audience. They have a tradition which the audience itself started in one of the early years. Many of them bring big stacks of paper with them to the theater, and they spend the whole night making paper airplanes and throwing them at the stage. And the people on stage throw them right back. Now, if you've ever been in a room with 1,100 people throwing paper airplanes continuously, which I, I doubt any of you have been except for the winners here, you will have noticed, if you were in that situation, this stuff piles up really fast, and it becomes necessary to have people sweeping this stuff, or it becomes impossible to walk around. So we always have at least a couple of people with brooms sweeping. Here's one of them. This is Roy Glauber, a Harvard physics professor who spent 10 years sweeping paper airplanes at the Ig Nobel ceremony. And after he'd spent 10 years doing that, he got a telephone call one day at home from Stockholm, Sweden, informing him that he had been chosen to win a Nobel Prize in physics. And uh, not because he was doing this, but <laughs> this didn't stop him. And ever since then, Roy continued to come to the Ig Nobel ceremonies where he helped to hand out the prizes and continued to sweep paper airplanes. And I'm showing you this mostly, though, because Roy also died just a few weeks ago. He was in his 90s. He also had a long and, I think, pretty good life. And we're going to miss him a lot. Um, but I have his broom, which he gave to me, so the broom is going to continue. This picture, by the way, it's you easy to date. Now. Pardon? You are the sweeper. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, the suggestion is I will be sweeping. I'm busy that night. But <laughs> if, if you're free that night, you know. Okay. Um, we can date this picture pretty easily. If you look between the broom and Roy, you see a suit of armor. That's Troy Hurtabise's suit of armor. This was the year Troy won his prize. And now a quick look at the most recent group of Ig Nobel Prize winners. We gave a prize in the field of medicine. That went to two doctors who used roller coaster rides to try and hasten the passage of kidney stones. Anyone here had kidney stones ever? Okay. They were rather painful. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, probably most of you at least know somebody who has had kidney stones, and they are often said to be perhaps the most painful thing a human being can endure. This is the uh, paper written by the doctors who uh, thought about all this stuff, and you can see the title is it's long, Validation of a da 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 while riding a roller coaster. 
This is some detail from that medical paper just to illustrate the journey that one of these stones take. When it happens, it is an actual stone that forms in your kidney, and then it has to make the journey out into your urine stream. And if you're lucky, it goes straight out of your body. But if you're not lucky, it gets stuck somewhere in there, which is awful. So that's, that's the basics of what happens with kidney stones. They had a patient. This was actually a, a case that started with the patient, not with the doctor thinking of something. They had a patient who went to Disney World in Florida and rode on this roller coaster. And when he got off the roller coaster, he passed a kidney stone. He was one of those people who has a lot of kidney stones. So he thought about it for a couple of seconds, and he got right back on the roller coaster, <laughs> rode it again, and he passed a second kidney stone. So he got off and got on again, and he passed a third kidney stone. And after all this, he went and he called his doctors to tell them about it. They were pretty surprised and, and, uh, and, and started to think hard about this. Uh, this, by the way, is the patient. <laughs> and this is one of the doctors at the Ig Nobel ceremony accepting his prize. We gave a prize in the field of anthropology, the study of people and apes and monkeys and all animals closely related to them. This was a team based in Sweden. They were honored for collecting evidence in a zoo that chimpanzees imitate humans about as often and about as well as humans imitate chimpanzees. They wrote this paper called Spontaneous Cross-Species Imitation in Interactions Between Chimpanzees and Zoo Visitors. This is some research they did. And here's part of the team at the Ig Nobel ceremony uh, getting some advice about finishing their speech. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Prize for Biology was awarded to a large team also based in Sweden. This was a good year for Sweden. This team won for demonstrating that wine experts, people who buy and evaluate fine wines, wine experts can reliably identify purely by smell the presence of a single fly in a glass of wine. Here's the paper that describes all that. The paper's called The Scent of the Fly. This is a fly in a glass of wine. And here's the team accepting their prize. We, uh, we then arranged a demonstration with some of the scientists on stage. Only one of these glasses had a fly in it. See if you can guess which one. And they, they had some samples of this chemical, and it's really potent. They, were, they did this paper partly because when they noticed this, they were surprised at how strong it is. They had, it's a chemical they think the mean, it has some meaning to the flies in communicating something, but they, they're kind of puzzled about why it's so noticeable by humans. So this is ongoing scientific mystery here. Um, the chemistry prize. The chemistry prize went to a team from Portugal, who measured the degree to which human saliva, spit, is a good cleaning agent for dirty surfaces. They published this paper about it called Human Saliva as a Cleaning Agent for Dirty Surfaces. These are people who work in art museums, good art museums. They're the people who take care of those expensive paintings and sculptures and everything else. And it has not been well known outside the profession that spit has been always one of the main fluids they use to clean things. They started to wonder, though, <laughs> is this a good idea? And they did, if you look at just the words here, you can see this was a pretty in-depth chemical investigation of that question. And they say they found that, yes, indeed, spit is, for those purposes, one of the best cleaning substances you could possibly use. The winners of this prize were not able to travel to the ceremony, and so one of them made a little video acceptance speech. We played this at the ceremony, and I would like to play it for you. It's short. On behalf of my mentor, Dr. Adilbi Alarcão, and myself, I would like to thank the IG Nobel 
Board of Governors for considering our work. And also, it, I know that it seems quite improbable, but human saliva is indeed an effective cleaning agent for surface, surfaces like paintings, sculptures, or gilded wood. But don't try to use it in your kitchen counters. Thank you, and have a nice evening. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. We gave a prize in the field of medical education. Went to a doctor from Japan, Dr. Akira Horiuchi. He got his prize for the medical report that he wrote called colonoscopy. Anybody need help with this word? Okay, colonoscopy in the sitting position. <laughs> Lessons learned <laughs> from self-colonoscopy. <laughs> Here's the paper. This is the top of the front page. I'm going to show you the rest of the front page of this paper. <laughs> Dr. Horiuchi traveled from Japan over to the US to come to the ceremony. He was very excited. And he was so excited, he insisted on doing a demonstration on stage. The Ig Nobel Prize for Literature was awarded to a team based in Australia. They won for documenting that most people who use complicated products do not read the instruction manual. <laughs> Here's a paper they wrote about it called Life is Too Short to RTFM. And here's the head of that team at the ceremony wearing a special dress that she commissioned. We gave a prize in the field of nutrition this year. Went to James Cole, who calculated that the caloric intake, the nutritional value from a human cannibalism diet, is significantly lower than the caloric intake from most other traditional meat diets. He wrote this paper called Assessing the Caloric Significance of Episodes of Human Cannibalism in the Paleolithic. Here he is accepting his Ig Nobel Prize. The Peace Prize, which many people consider the most prestigious of the Ig Nobel Prizes, was awarded to a team based in Spain. They won for measuring the frequency, the motivation, and the effects of shouting and cursing while driving an automobile. Whoop. I'll show you that again. And here's their paper called Shouting and Cursing While Driving, Frequency, Reasons, Perceived Risk and Punishment. Oop. Sorry about the technical thing here. That's, uh, that's one of the team members giving his acceptance speech. And uh, he was doing just fine until the little girl came over, at which point he began shouting and cursing. We gave a prize in the field of reproductive medicine. Went to three doctors who used postage stamps to test whether the male sex organ is functioning properly. They described their technique in a study called Nocturnal Penile Tumescence Monitoring with Stamps. <laughs> Here is the, uh, the paper. And Probably I should explain a little bit more about that. Many doctors have patients who are older men who come to them complaining that they, are, they the patient, uh, is not getting a, an erection as much as they used to or as properly as they used to, or there's some problem. And the first question usually the doctor tries to answer is, is this a biological, is it just a physical problem, or is this some psychological thing that's the main part of it. Now, if you're the doctor and you have a patient coming to you asking this, how do you determine the truth of the, the answer? Doctors have believed for a long time, and probably is true from what they're all saying, that most adult men have several erections in a typical night. 
the number they mentioned is seven or eight on average. So if the doctor could just stay there with the patient all night and observe, the doctor could answer the question. Of course, if the man is sleeping on his stomach, then it's a little more complicated. But obviously, that's not <laughs> too easy for anybody. For a long time, what doctors have done is use some equipment that's very complicated and very expensive and very embarrassing for the patients and for the doctors. It's not an ideal situation. These doctors came up with a much quicker, simpler, and far less expensive technique, postage stamps. This also is illustrations from their published paper. So postage stamps in most of the world until recently came like that in a roll or a strip of perforated things that you can easily tear apart. What they would tell the patient is, take a roll of stamps, wrap it around your penis just before you go to sleep, and then seal it. In the morning when you wake up, if it's broken, that's good news. <laughs> that's the whole technique. Costs almost nothing. Here are two of the doctors at the Ig Nobel ceremony. This one is a little more subtle. <laughs> and finally, the economics prize, the Ig Nobel Prize for Economics, went to a large team from China, Canada, and a couple other countries based primarily in Canada. They won for investigating whether it's effective for employees to use voodoo dolls against abusive bosses. They wrote this paper about it called Writing a Wrong, Retaliation on a Voodoo Doll Symbolizing an Abusive Supervisor Restores Justice. Would you like any explanation on this, or is this sufficiently clear? Explanation. They say that all the time in much of the world, pretty much every day, there are people who get extremely angry at their boss. Sometimes it's because they've just been fired, but for other reasons, too. And that far more than most people realize, this does happen, and a number of those people are quite seriously thinking about committing murder. And it does happen sometimes. So that's what they were looking at. Was there, they wanted to see if there was something they could come up with that would um, get these angry people to the point where they're no longer on the verge of actually killing their boss, thus the voodoo doll. And they say in their tests anyway that the results convince them that a voodoo doll, where you get a chance to stick pins symbolically into your, uh, your, your boss who you hate, um, for a lot of people makes enough of a difference that they're no longer in danger of trying to commit murder. Here's the team at the ceremony. One of them's holding up a voodoo doll which they purchased from a company that makes voodoo dolls. <laughs> and this next part I'm not sure about, but I think this company specializes in making voodoo dolls for academics. <laughs> At the end of the ceremony every year, we ask all of the winners, all of the other scientists on stage, all of the opera performers, everybody to gather for a pointless photo opportunity. And that's what you see here. Now, I want to tell you about one other part of the ceremony and how it was based on this paper, which won an Ig Nobel Prize years ago. I'm going to talk about one of the operas. This paper was the thing that won the Ig Nobel Prize in psychology in the year 2000. The paper was written the year before. The authors are named Dunning and Kruger. And you may have seen in the news, especially the last couple of years, the phrase, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I will describe to you. And it comes from this paper. This paper became quite famous in psychology and then beyond. Uh, the title pretty much says it all. The title is Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. Let me read that again. Unskilled and unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments.
Every year, we, I write a little opera that's performed as part of the ceremony, usually three or four songs interspersed with the, other, the awards and the other things. And uh, recently, this opera was about incompetence. There's been a lot of study in psychology and, and many other fields about competence versus incompetence. So this was based on some of these studies. I'm going to show you video from that first performance that was part of the Ig Nobel ceremony. And it's the final song, it's the thrilling conclusion to the opera. The main character in this opera that you'll see here is a psychologist who goes into a bar where he does not know anybody. He's a stranger, but he goes into this bar, and he's the kind of person who feels he needs to explain to everybody something they don't know. He's going to explain all about the Dunning-Kruger effect. And you're also going to see the people in the bar and how they react to him, the customers and the people who work there, how they react to this psychologist they don't know coming in and insisting on explaining to them all about the Dunning-Kruger effect. We have the lights down. Dunning Kruger. Dunning Kruger. Psychologists have shown that people unskilled at something. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect for you. Yeah. It's great that you used the Nessun Dorma. Everyone is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, see, well, I, I won't show you this stuff because we, we have too much other stuff, the live human beings, to talk to you. But um, we collect stuff like this in my magazine as well. It comes out every two months. There's lots of stuff on the website. I do want to mention before I finish my little piece of this that most of the things that win Ig Nobel Prizes, we hear about from one person somewhere. Somebody notices something wonderful or something terrible, and they tell us about it. If you ever run across somebody 
who you think deserves an Ig Nobel Prize, do the thing you always do. Tell three or four friends, but then share it with us so we can maybe share it with the world. And if you think you deserve a prize, great, let us know. Every year, between 10 and 20% of all those nominations we get are people who nominate themselves. They almost never win. <laughs> but a few do. And some of them you may even know of. Um, at least one of them is Dutch. Uh, Franz de Waal, some of you may know, nominated himself and one of his graduate students. And they won an Ig Nobel Prize. They did an experiment in which they demonstrated, they say, that chimpanzees can recognize, merely by looking at photographs of the rear ends of other chimpanzees, they can recognize which chimpanzee that rear end belongs to. Okay. If, if Franz ever comes here, you can ask him any details you want to know about it. Yes? I saw that virtually any winner ha had managed to convince a journal to publish the... Well, all right, the, the, quest, the, quest, the question is that, uh, that uh, gee, the, these winners managed to persuade journals to publish this stuff. How, how does this happen? Is it part of the price? No. Price that, first of all, it doesn't matter whether you've published something. It doesn't matter whether you're a scientist. It does not matter whether you're old or young. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. But something that I would like you to consider about these Ig Nobel Prizes and about everything else in the world if these are funny to you or to other people, usually it's because it's outside your normal experience. It's so far outside your experience that, of course, your only healthy reaction immediately is to laugh. Now, anything that's inside your own normal experience, of course, is just ordinary. Most of the things that win prizes are things that people are doing in their normal life. It's not unusual to them. And most of the time, they have a very good reason from their point of view for doing it. And you might think about, here's, here's the kind of perspective that, that uh, might change things a bit for some of you. You might think about, pick a, uh, say, uh, an hour during the week, say Wednesday morning from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. If you were to write down in great detail what you do next Wednesday morning from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and then you go show it to somebody you know, your grandmother, say, or grandfather, or somebody far away from you, they would probably look at the detail and decide that this person is a little crazier than I, <laughs> than I realized. We all do things that are ordinary to us after the first few weeks we're doing them, but may not seem that way to anybody else. This stuff is just an example of that. It's a very human activity. Now, um, I'll take questions later on if, if you have some. For now, we have two living Ig Nobel Prize winners. And now we will dive into the philosophy of everything. Lisa, take the stage. Yes. Um, and uh, join me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now this is time for reflection. You know, we've been laughing a lot. Um, so first of all, before we get into the, the, the um, talking about the valuable in this kind of research, is there, is there uh, an Ig Nobel Prize? Has there been awarded for, for, for laughing? Is there research on laughing? What is this? We've been laughing a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what, what's, yeah. Are we, why are we laughing so much and how is that important in uh, scientific research? And I, I, I think that's an important question and I think there's nobody who really has any clear idea how to begin answering that. Any question about human behavior, about why does somebody do something, it's easy to come up with an answer, but it's very difficult to have any confidence that that answer is true. Please, do try. Small answer. Well, with the Ig Nobel Prizes, I think there's a piece of it that's fairly clear, which I mentioned a few times, that these things that win a prize, generally what's funny about them, on top of, way above everything else, it's just something you have never thought of before. 
And when something you've never conceived of suddenly appears before you, most people start to laugh. I don't know why that is, but we do. And I think, I think that's the story. That's, that's as much of the truth that, as I feel confident in describing. Yeah. No, because... Yeah. So when we're laughing here tonight, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's nice laughing, of course. I, I don't know, we... We, we recognize that something is strange, but also very true or something. But I think this is a question for the both of you. Um, it's strange research you did, or strange research you, you uh, shared with the world. Where, have you been afraid that we, p people would laugh at you at any stage? Were you laughed at in a, in a, uh, a less nice way? And has this, I don't know, made you not publish or not want to publish? It took you five years. Yeah, well, if I can start, it, 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 uh, I, 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 was, I, was, I was quiet about this about, for about six years. Yeah. I, I, I told it, well, you know, at, in, in the pub or at birthday parties. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I didn't share it with, with other duck enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but were you afraid? But, uh, because, yeah, be because but how, what was the reaction at birthday parties? Oh, this was, was. I mean, of course they liked the story. I tell yeah. it again. Tell it again. Yeah. Yeah. Tell more details. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 to share it with 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 colleagues with peers, that's a different story. Especially yeah. because I had no clue about what happened and why and 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 how often does it? Am I the only one? And this oh, was yeah. uh, this was before the internet, so you, you had to look into books that were forgotten to find information. But so it was quite brave, maybe, for you to do this to to to. to yeah, yeah, to it was uh, it was kind of it was it was yeah. It, it took me six years to decide to do, and, and good friends kind of urged me to do. Now you sit down and write it. Yeah. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. yeah. But why? What did it? Why did you do it in the end? Because. It's, oh, yeah, it it yeah. is, of course, a funny story, so I know, oh. I know uh, why you would tell it at birthday parties, mm -hmm. but why did you think it was important scientifically? So what, I don't know. It was unknown in ducks, so I said, well, it should be, it should be in the book, in the, in the big bird book. Yeah. And that's what it was, well, one of these seven or eight people who read it actually wrote a line in the handbook of the birds of the world saying, okay, necro yeah. homosexual necrophilia once in Rotterdam. And I, 1995, dot, yeah. that's it. That was my contribution to science. To science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, is, and, na and now that's, that's changed, I think. Your, your contribution to science has, or is it still, I don't know, it's a, it's a footnote somewhere. It's a, it's a lemma in a... Yeah, but it's, it's, it's growing. I mean, it, this is, this, it, it's appeared that it's more common than we think, that it's almost everywhere, and that is, it is related to the way and humans change the world. Mm. So, yeah. that's, that's more of a big, bigger picture than I had in, back in 1995. Yeah. Okay, so the question I just thought of that I've never asked you before hearing this. Now that you've seen many cases involving different kinds of animals, do you see anything at all related to this in human behavior? No. This is, this is, I mean, in, in human behavior, necrophilia is a, is a black page. It's, 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 it's really taboo. It's, uh, well, people, people go to the Peter Baan Centrum here if you do things like that. That's the, well, that's the, the, the that's so not there's good. no research into it, really. There is, there is research into it, yeah. Mm. There, there's even a classification of necrophilia in humans, mm. yeah. Ranging from well, well, you you don't want to read this. This is no. this horrible. Yeah. It's not, yeah. not not for yeah. laughing. I'm I'm happy. I stick to the the human to yeah. to the uh, to, to the animals. Uh, yeah. 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 But how is that? So so we'll we'll leave the ducks, the dead ducks, okay. for now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So how's that been for you? I can imagine that the ha huh is is uh, a bit less scary to to do research into and to. Uh, um, elaborate on in papers and discuss with your peers, but th did you feel foolish at, at times? Um, well, so for us it was really bycatch in this larger research program, and we felt that it was sufficiently new to at least publish a paper on it. When we found it out, I think my first notes of it date from 2010 or something, 
Um, we worked for a couple of years to gather more data. So we had data for a handful of languages, then had 10 languages for which we had loads of uh, conversations, and then added another uh, 20 or so, just to make sure that we were really onto something. In linguistics, you know, with you know, the thousands of languages spoken around the world, you don't really know something uh, is uh, uh, widespread until you've checked enough unrelated languages. So knowing just two or three or five is not enough. So we worked on it until yeah. we had a better case, and then we decided to publish it. Um, actually, we didn't realize how... Um, like, we were surprised by the media storm that we ended up in. This was even before the Ig Nobel Prize in 2015. So in 2013, when the paper was published, the New York Times wrote about it, uh, yeah. The Guardian, a couple other big newspapers around the world, and suddenly everybody else thought it was news too. And so we were uh, inundated with, with requests for interviews and so on. And, you know, there were good takes, many good takes, I'd like to say, but of course also some bad takes, I knew. What the Daily Mail wrote was something like, the most annoying word in the English language is now universal. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, taking the research, mistaking it in so many levels that, you know, it wasn't even worth for us to bother about. Many yeah. other newspapers had better stories. So, and in the end, I think we're quite happy that, uh, that we published it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, because uh, there seems to be some sort of tradition for uh, Ig Nobel Prize winners becoming Nobel Prize winners. Um, <laughs> Can we, can we take the Ig Nobel Prize as some sort of indicator for, for Nobel Prize, like, um, like the, the Golden Globes are for the Oscars? You can take it any way you like. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it likely that he will get a Nobel Prize for this at one point? I think it's no more likely or less likely now that he's gotten his Ig Nobel. Yeah. There, has, uh, there are two people so far who have both a Nobel Prize and an Ig Nobel Prize. The more famous one is the only person who has, as an individual, uh, Ig Nobel awarded to him and a Nobel. That's Andre Geim, who was right here yeah. in this yeah. town when he won the prize. And uh, we gave him a prize in the year 2000. In case you don't know, that was because he and another scientist used magnets to levitate a frog something which seemed completely absurd to most people, even to them, which is part of why they did it. They mm. like looking for things that seem absurd and almost impossible to understand, and then trying to understand it. That's what they do. Yeah. Ten years later, Andre Geim was awarded a Nobel Prize. And when you look at the details of what he did that won that Nobel Prize, it seems just as goofy as what he did with, <laughs> the, uh, with the frog. Which is there something in the goofiness that makes it good research? There's something in the science? goofiness that makes it worth looking at. When I I have many roles now, but one of them is I'm the editor of a science magazine, and I have been for almost 30 years. And one of the many nice things about that is I have a license to talk to almost any scientist in the world, and I've got to know a lot of them and spend a lot of time. And something that I've seen over and over again, and also in in reading history of science is most of the things we're taught in school, your head is filled, and my head is filled with great scientific discoveries. And we were taught, everybody realized immediately how important these things were. That's almost never what happened. Mm. Almost always what happened was when somebody first started working on an idea or they first discover something and they tell people, they get told, that's stupid or that's foolish, don't do that. And people sometimes do a lot worse than that. That's almost always what happens in the various earliest stage. Later on, if the thing becomes widely known and people feel it translates to money and power and whatever, and it gets into the textbooks, that early version of the story almost mm. disappears. You have to dig hard for it. But would you say that the Ig Nobel Prize is too... I don't know really about, the, uh, about how it started, but maybe we can get to that later. But is, is the... Um, the Ig Nobel Prize um, also, I don't know, a way to uh, tell us that uh, when it's related to, to scientific research that we shouldn't, I don't know, ha uh, be too much focused on things having to be very useful that you can tell right away that it's very useful research. In, in, uh, nowadays in universities you have to valorize, you have mm. to make sure that it's, I don't know, you can, you can see what you can use it for right away. Is yeah. the Ig Nobel Prize a way uh, yeah, it's to, one, to, to talk back to that? It's one little reminder of that, and that in the largest sense. 
that when you, f- you do not have to decide, there's nothing that forces you when you first hear about something to make a decision about whether that thing is important or not. Nobody's forcing you to do that, but everybody's telling you <laughs> that it's yeah. important or that that thing is not important. Most things that are invented turn out, everybody later realizes, turn out to have been invented many times by many different people mm. in pla- different places at different times. What, what does that tell us? That tells us that you can do the greatest thing a human being ever did. You can have the most brilliant thought, and probably it will go nowhere. <laughs> it might be the third person or the hundredth person who gets noticed. Maybe it's the first person, but usually not. Now, you can take that as being very discouraging, mm. but it's also very encouraging, I think. It also means, look, you think of some, everybody here has thought of brilliant things, and then I'm sure the people around you say, ah, that's nothing. People already knew that. Well, it is something. You did do something great when you thought about that. You just didn't happen to be the first one, or you didn't happen to be the first one that got noticed. That's all. You still had a great idea. You still did something great. But so you mentioned that in the sciences, a lot of or, or ca- things were or, you, or you did something stupid. Or you did something stupid. Okay. So, but, but by accident, things are discovered that are very interesting. Um, is 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 that what makes a scientist good to develop a flair for the? I don't know, uh, the coincidental that's of value. So to develop a certain attentiveness to things that are important that you might not have been looking for in the first place. Is that something that you can relate to? That you think I do my best science when I'm, I don't know, being very attentive to things that I might not have been looking for right away, but now I notice them that are of value? It it seems to be like your your art project was a side project in the first... Yeah. In the first instance. So we weren't looking for anything like a universal word. In fact, any linguist would declare you crazy if you were doing that, because as we know, languages differ, and we don't expect to have any uh, universal words. So we weren't looking for it in the first place. We were just doing careful, maybe almost boring work of just cataloging how often does it happen that people misunderstand each other, and when they do, how do they fix it? And we thought it was interesting and important to charted that larger system of repair. Uh, And in the process of doing so and and understanding that system as a system, we also found we happened on a universal word. So it was like really a serendipitous finding. I don't think actually you can switch on your your sense of serendipity and 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 see these things all the time you know that's the whole point of serendipity you you can be open to it or less open to it i think but there's no sense in which you can just say now i'm gonna just you know see only the uh, unexpected things i don't think it happens like that Mm. but you can decide to try to notice more Mm. when something's unexpected instead of noticing and then turning away to not turn away and pay, yeah. pay at least one minute of attention to it. Yeah, I, I learned to pay attention carefully. W- whatever happens, um, look, listen, hear. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. sure. And I can imagine, so where your, your research is concerned, there's, I don't know, you <laughs> you get a little, I don't know, <laughs> um, um, uh, scared maybe sometimes, and uh, it's very weird, it's very weird. So you have to be, I don't know, courageous in a way to, to keep on looking, you know, to be, is that a thing? Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I was courageous for 75 minutes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what was the, the um, which emotion... What was the main emotion? Was it curiosity? Was it amazement? Ama- was it, it was it definitely amazement. Yeah, amazement. I said, I was really watch, well, looking at my watch. I said, hey, well, when is this going to end? Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm now nowadays I'm criticized because I stopped it. I mean, I mean, I. You stopped it. I stopped it. I mean, I was I was getting hungry. I saw. I, I watched <laughs> it for 75 <laughs> minutes. I wanted to go home. Yeah. But yeah, well, uh, I should have let nature take its course. So and you it, so it you went it, outside it, and you I went outside and I okay. shoo, 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 yeah. you know, <laughs> and 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 uh, this was well, well it, it might have been a battle between me and the duck well, for who could endure it. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, Kiss, now that you have more experience with this, if you had allowed nature to take its course, do you, can you estimate how long it might have gone? Um, it, it could have taken several more hours. Yeah, there, 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 is, there, is, there, is, a, there, there is a case of a, of a couple of turkeys in, in the US. One flew into the electric fence of a prison. Um, and um, so this behavior also occurred. It was uh, heterosexual necrophilia. And it took all day. And it was witnessed by all the prisoners. <laughs> oh, my. So, yeah. 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 Because they couldn't go out and stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did they publish it, though? Yeah. No, but they sent me the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh uh, yeah, eating eating it afterwards. That is a mm. that is a. I don't really want to think about that really. But is there? Um, could you please tell us uh, about improbable research, ignoble research, uh, and a, a prize that was awarded that was the weirdest, the weirdest story or the weirdest? No, we do the scientific thing. The weirdest research. So you, 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 you told us, you gave us a lot of examples. I would have to pick one at random. I'll pick one yeah. at random. Please do. There's a prize given to uh, a couple of scientists in Norway who were trying to understand something about leeches. And they were trying to determine the best way to stimulate the appetite of a leech. And they discovered leeches are have their appetite stimulated by, uh, I think, three things. Uh, beer, sour cream, and what was the third one? Do you remember, Case? And something uh, else. Something else, <laughs> yeah. And the reason sour. that they were doing it was that leeches used to be used in medicine pretty much around the world, and then they stopped being used for yep. whatever reason. But eventually, doctors realized that for particular kinds of things, garlic, leeches, garlic, 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 yeah, garlic. Yeah. Yeah. ale, sour yeah. cream, and garlic, yeah. if you yeah. are ever yeah. in need. And you may be, and I'll tell you why you may be in need. This is what they discovered. Yeah. For certain kinds of things, um, a good example is if your finger is cut off, but you still have it, and you can find a doctor who knows how to attach it soon enough. The problem is how do you control the blood flow during the operation? If you don't control it properly, you're not going to have a finger that works or stays on. So leeches turned out to be much better than anything else people know. There's something in their saliva, I guess, that, that keeps the blood at just the right consistency. So leeches have become popular for that particular kind of thing and several more. All right, so you're a doctor. Uh, a patient comes in with her finger. Great. And you're going to sew them on. And you get your leech. And the leech is not hungry. <laughs> what do you do? How do you stimulate the appetite of a leech? Yeah. That's what they were investigating. Yeah, yeah so that's very weird that's very research, weird. but, but, yeah. but and, very and, and, and let me translate that, too, into direct action. If you ever um, have your finger cut off um, and you still have it, on the way to the doctor, stop at the store and get either ale sour cream or garlic, and bring that along with your finger to the doctor. Is that good <laughs> advice? Mm. Yeah, so very practical advice, too. Yeah. 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 Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.